குட் ஈவினிங் ஆஸ்பிரண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு தி ஹிந்து நியூஸ் அனாலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஐஎஸ் அகாடமி ஃபார் த டேட் சிக்ஸ்டீன்த் ஆஃப் செப்டம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி டூ The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. With this, let's move on to the news analysis. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about a meeting chaired by Chief Secretary of Tamil Nadu yesterday. In the meeting, it was discussed about drafting a policy for organic farming in Tamil Nadu. So, in this background, let us understand what is organic farming and some of the government's initiative to promote it in India. So, coming to the question, what is organic farming? See, organic farming is a method of farming in which crops are grown using organic manure, biofertilizers and by adopting other nature-friendly practices. Or to put it more simply, it is a farming method in which the use of synthetic chemicals and fertilizers are strictly prohibited. Here note that manure is obtained naturally by the decomposition of dead plants and animals. while biofertilizers or living organisms when added to the soil will result in improved plant productivity most importantly organic farming reduces reliance on external inputs and it also maximizes productivity by making the best use of ecological principles and processes ultimately it will result in lower crop cultivation costs now let us see some of the initiatives of government of india to promote organic farming First initiative which we are going to discuss is Paramparhat Krishi Vikas Yojana shortly known as PKVY see under PKVY organic farming is promoted through adoption of organic village by cluster approach here in cluster approach farmers come together to form a land cluster having at least 50 acre land this land will be used for organic farming as part of the scheme PGS certificates are given for the products produced here Know that PGS or Participatory Guarantee System is a process of certifying organic products which ensures that their production takes place in accordance with the well laid down quality standards. Second scheme which we are going to discuss is Mission Organic Value Chain Development for the Northeastern Region. See, this scheme was brought in to realize the potential of organic farming in the northeast region of the country. This scheme promotes third party certified organic farming of niche crops of northeastern region through farmer producer organizations. It primarily focuses on exports. Here niche crops are nothing but crops that specifically grow in the northeastern part of our country. Other schemes regarding organic farming are given here for your reference. You can have a look. This is all with respect to the schemes of government of India regarding organic farming. Now let's see a few additional facts relating to organic farming in India. First, Sikkim, one of the northeastern states of India, practices organic farming. From the year 2003, Sikkim has stopped the import of chemical fertilizers into the state. Its farmers only use organic manures for cultivation. This has resulted in Sikkim becoming the first organic state of the country. Second, India is an import dependent nation with regards to chemical fertilizers. It imports a huge quantity of fertilizers from abroad which depletes its foreign currency reserves. Now, with growing research towards organic farming in India, a move towards organic farming will help India solve its perennial problem of import dependence on fertilizers. Through this discussion, we have learned about organic farming and some of the major schemes of government of India regarding it and a few additional facts regarding organic farming in India. With this, let's move on to the next news article. Have a look at this news article. This article reports about the defection of the members of Legislative Assembly of Goa. This is in news because recently in Goa, eight MLAs of the Congress party had defected to the ruling BJP party. In this context we will learn about the anti defection law its provisions exceptions mentioned in the law its shortcomings and then finally recommendation of various committees relating to the law the syllabus for this discussion is highlighted here for your reference now let's see what is anti defection law for better understanding first we have to know what defection means see the word defection basically means to abandon one's duty or allegiance Now in the political sense defection refers to the act of changing one's party's allegiance for example we will take the recent defection in goa 
here the eight mlas were initially got elected from the congress party but now they had vacated the congress and joined the bjp this is what is called as defection so to address this evil of political defections the anti defection law was passed in the year 1985 now let us see in detail about this anti defection law see the 52nd constitutional amendment of 1985 added a 10th schedule to the constitution the schedule speaks about the anti defection law here the anti defection law lays down the procedure by which the members can be disqualified on grounds of defection by the preceding officer of the legislature they can be disqualified based on a petition by any member of the house note that the term members include both the members of the parliament and the members of the state legislative assembly now let's see about some provisions of the anti defection law c section 2 of the anti defection law provides for the disqualification of the members of the house belonging to any political party on the following grounds firstly if the member voluntarily gives up the membership of the party he shall be disqualified second if the member votes in the house against the direction of his party or if he completely abstains from voting against the direction of his party without obtaining any prior permission then he can be disqualified based on the above grounds we can say that a member elected on a political party ticket should continue in the party by obeying the party's direction if not there is a chance that they may face disqualifications now coming to the independent members see the independent members that is members elected to the house independently without being a member of any political party they will be disqualified if they join any political party after the elections and now coming to the nominated members they can be disqualified if they join any political party after the expiry of 6 months from the date on which they join the house this means that the person can join any political party within 6 months of taking a seat in the house however the law provides two exception in relation to this procedure of disqualification now we will see about these exceptions first one is regarding merger c if a member voluntarily gives up the membership of the party as a result of his original party being merged with another party then they will not be disqualified a merger is construed to take place provided that two thirds of the member of the party have agreed to such merger coming to the second exception if a member after being elected as the presiding officer of the house voluntarily give up the membership of his party and rejoins the party after he ceases to hold that office in this situation they cannot be disqualified this exception has been provided with a view to uphold the dignity and impartiality of the office of the speaker note that the 91st constitutional amendment act of 2003 omitted an exception provision the omitted provision mentioned about disqualification on ground of defection doesn't apply in case of split the deleted provision said that if the member voluntarily gives up the membership of the party as a result of split of group of members from their original party then they will not be disqualified once again remember that this provision was removed by the 91st constitutional amendment act this is all about the exception provisions also remember any question regarding the disqualification arising out of defection will be decided by the presiding officer of the house here the presiding officer means the speaker originally the act provided that the decision of the presiding officer is final and cannot be questioned in any court but this was changed in the year 1993 in the famous kihoto holohan case the supreme court declared that this particular provision is unconstitutional since it takes away the jurisdiction of the supreme court and the high courts it further said the presiding officer while deciding a question under the 10th schedule should function as a tribunal which means that speaker's decision can be subjected to judicial review in terms of shortcomings now let's see about some of the shortcomings in the anti defection law speaking about the speaker's power in disqualification on the grounds of defection he or she is the ultimate deciding authority on the questions arising out of disqualification this particular provision leads to controversy because if a member from another party joins the ruling party then the speaker who is generally from the ruling party may delay the proceedings in favor of his party another problem with the anti defection law is that 
individual decision making of the members of the political parties gets affected because of it members of a political party are simply instructed to do what their party whips want them to do these are some of the problem areas with respect to the anti defection law now let's see some of the recommendations of the various committees to restructure the law first starting with the dinesh goswami committee on electoral reforms it recommended the issue of disqualification should be decided by the president or the governor on the advice of the election commission of india rather than by the speaker of the house if implemented it will result in reducing the political bias of the decisions made under the anti defection law now coming to the second recommendation the law commission report of 1999 said the provision which exempt mergers from disqualification should be deleted note that the 10th schedule legalizes wholesale defections while punishing retail defectors now coming to the final suggestion constitution review commission of 2002 suggested that the defector should be barred from holding public office or any remunerative political post for the duration of the remaining term the vote cast by a defector to topple a government should be treated as invalid this suggestion was included to help maintain a stable government that's all regarding the recommendations through this discussion we came to know about the anti defection law provisions of it and the need for restructuring the law with this let's move on to the next news article take a look at this news article this news article talks about kutub shahi tombs complex now suddenly it is in news because yesterday karnataka's minister for urban development inaugurated six restored wells inside the kutub shahi tombs complex in hyderabad the minister even stated that the restored heritage site will assist in making it a solid case for unesco world heritage city status So in this background let us revise about the Qutub Shahi dynasty Qutub Shahi dynasty refers to the Muslim rulers of the kingdom of Golconda in the southeastern Deccan region of India They ruled from 1518 up until 1687 during which Aurangzeb annexed the whole of Deccan to the Mughal empire Note that they were one of the five successor states of the Baghmani kingdom The other Deccani sultanates were Ahmednagar Berar Bidar and Bijapur These five sultanates ruled cumulatively the region present between the Vindhyan range and the Krishna river during the medieval period. First, let us see about how Qutub Shahi dynasty occupied the present day Telangana region. See, what happened is in 1463 disturbances broke out in the Telangana area of the Baghmani kingdom of Deccan. Sultan Quli Qutbul Mulk was sent to suppress the uprising. know that sultan kuli qutbul mulk was one among the high ranking military officer under the mohammad shah baghmani who ruled the baghmani kingdom that's why he was sent to silence the protesters and when he was successful he was appointed as the subadar of telangana with golconda as its headquarters in 1495 later with the disintegration of the baghmani kingdom in the early 16th century sultan kuli gained virtual independence As a result he established the Qutub Shahi dynasty it flourished from 1518 until 1687 when Aurangzeb's army invaded the Deccan you can see the extent of the kingdom in the image given here so the dynasty spanned 171 years in the history of south india and during this period eight kings ruled the land and its people note that the Qutub Shahi rulers were great builders and patrons of learning They not only patronized the Persian culture but also the regional culture of the Deccan. The Golconda Fort, Qutub Shahi tombs and the Char Minar are proof of it. Now look at these beautiful images. These are the Golconda Fort, Qutub Shahi tombs and Char Minar. Even though not located within the same complex, these three monuments together represent the earliest Qutub Shahi layer of Hyderabad's history. The Qutub Shahi tombs alone houses seven tombs. dedicated to the former kings of golconda now talking about specifically the qutub shahi architecture see the general architecture plan of these tombs include a raised square base an arched corridor runs around the main building it generally consists of a single or double story building with the tomb and huge bulbous dome built on the cylinder a small latticed wall all around the cylinder not only covers it but also gives an ornamental look to the dome as if it is wearing a necklace all the buildings are perfectly symmetrical which is a distinct feature of islamic architecture 
द आक्चुअल ग्रेव लाइस अंडरग्रउंड बिलो दि आर्नेट ग्रेव इन द मेन हाल द इंटरनल सीलिंग आफ दि डोम इज पेटेड वित् दि मोटिव आफ द टाइम सो दिस इज आल अबउट दि टूम्स आर्किटेक्चर आफ कुतुब शाही डनस्टी वित् दिस वि हव कम टू दि एंड आफ दिस पर्टिकुलर आर्टिकल डिस्कशन थ्रू दिस डिस्कशन वि हव सीन अबउट दि कुतुब शाही डनस्टी and the process through which the first ruler of this dynasty occupied power and also about their tomb architecture with this let's move on to the prelims practice question discussion we have two different questions taken up for today's discussion coming to the first question it's a two statement question let me read out the question consider the following statements natural farming does not use chemical or organic fertilizers on the soil coming to the second statement there is no plowing soil tilling and weeding in natural farming The question asks for the incorrect statement. Statement one is correct. C. Even though both natural and organic farming methods are chemical free, organic farming still uses fertilizers and manures such as compost, vermicompost, etc. Natural farming does not use chemical or organic fertilizers on the soil. In reality, no additional nutrients are put into the soil or given to the plants. Natural farming increases the breakdown of organic matter by microorganisms and earthworms right on the soil surface gradually adding nutrients to the soil over time so statement 1 is correct now coming to the second statement because of this unique farming method plowing tilling mixing manure weeding and other fundamental agro activities are not done in natural farming So statement 2 is also correct so the correct answer for this question is option D neither one nor two Now coming to the second prelims practice question consider the following pairs we have four pairs of dynasties given we have to match the dynasties with the regions they have ruled the question asks for how many pairs given are correctly matched the answer for this question is option D all four pairs let's see briefly about the bagmani kingdom and the break up of the bagmani kingdom into five different kingdoms Bagmani kingdom being one of the great medieval indian kingdoms was founded against Muhammad bin Tughlaq of the Delhi Sultanate after nearly 150 years of rule Bagmani kingdom disintegrated into five different kingdoms in the early 16th century these kingdoms were ruled by five different dynasties Nizam Shahis ruled the Ahmednagar Qutub Shahis ruled the Hyderabad which we have seen deeply in our news analysis today Barich Shahis ruled the Bidar region Imad Shahis ruled the Berar region and finally bijapur was ruled by the adil shahi kingdom with this we have come to the end of the prelims practice question discussion i have displayed a mains practice question interested aspirants can write your answers and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the video if you have liked the today's video like comment share and if you want to see further videos like this please subscribe to shankar ias academy